Morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Denise Lucy. I'm so happy to welcome you. Today is our business edge briefing. And my name is Denise, as I mentioned, and I am the professor and executive director of Dominican University of California's Institute for Leadership Studies. And we are in partnership with the North Bay Leadership Council. We've done this program with each other for about a decade, and we offer the program called the Business Edge Briefing Series. Together, we have welcomed business owners and organizational leaders to share business strategies and techniques for their businesses to be resilient and competitive in the domestic and global marketplaces. What is our goal? Is to unite and ignite innovation, inspire creativity, and increase profits and productivity. And who are our speakers? They're engaging and exceptional business experts who inspire and educate business leaders to survive and thrive through tough economic conditions. Cynthia Murray, CEO of the North Bay Leadership Council, will moderate the Q&A today and announce upcoming events. You'll meet her soon. We'd also like to thank our community partners the San Rafael Chamber of Commerce that unites us and supports our local businesses. On campus, we have two great business partners in our Borowski School of Business. The Marin Small Business Development Center called the SBDC. It provides no cost business advising with experts and assists small businesses with obtaining pandemic funding, HR support, e-commerce, uh, social media setup, pivoting strategies, and more. And in the past year, SBDC has helped over 1,300 businesses. So please be in touch with us so we can help. Today's program is also hosted by our campus partner, the U.S. Commercial Service. The U.S. Commercial Service has been led by Elizabeth Krauth on our campus for the past 18 years and as a fantastic partner. The U.S. Commercial Service is the lead trade promotion agency of the United States government, providing counseling and support by trade professionals to help U.S. companies to export or to increase sales to new global markets. So it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce our presenters and welcome Elizabeth Krauth the Director of the U.S. Commercial Service and the U.S. Department of Commerce. Elizabeth will introduce our speakers. Hello, Great. Elizabeth. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Denise. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. Today, our first presenter, Joshua Erickson, is the Program Manager of the U.S. Commercial Services Rural Export Center. Joshua oversees the completion of international market research projects, and website globalization evaluations, as well as nationwide outreach and educational webinars. He will share two key strategies to grow your business by selling to international markets. One, website globalization, and two, working with export management companies. Each strategy will be followed by a company who's increased their sales by using that specific strategy. Please join me in welcoming Joshua Erickson. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to, as Elizabeth said, talk about some ways that you can improve um, improve your exporting. And uh, just pull up here. So uh, I'm from the Rural Export Center, as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth mentioned. And I think that maybe the just to lay the groundwork of, of uh, this seminar today, is to understand um, exporting itself, right? So international sales can be a key part of your business strategy. Uh, companies that export can position themselves for success, uh, greater success than just a company that doesn't export, right? Um, especially in a rural area, I think the thought might be, well, can a rural company export? And the answer to that is definitively yes. You can have companies can export wherever you are, and it can be a, a key part of of the value that your business provides to your customers. So the Rural Export Center, we're part of the commercial service. And uh, we actually started in 2020 
um, during kind of the beginning of the pandemic as to meet the needs of businesses around uh, just getting information about uh, exporting, getting information about international markets and being able to make informed business decisions. So I have um, here at the beginning of my presentation, I have some slides that I've left in just kind of for information, informational purposes. You can see some examples of some of the different types of information type resources we provide to companies. But uh, these slides will be sent out afterwards. So I won't spend much time talking about these, these slides. I just leave them in here for, for your purposes, for your edification later. And um, we'll skip forward to our programming today. So today I'm gonna talk about some key aspects of website globalization. You know, and why, you know, how you can use your website to help you export. So we'll go over some strategy. We'll talk about what your domain looks like when you're, when you're setting up an international site, search engine considerations, and also some, some simple enhancements you can start working on today to make your website more internationally attractive. So I'll, I'll uh, just read this little part here. Website globalization is the process of making your website world ready. So is your website world ready now? Is it functional for uh, someone from a different country? Can they use it to find you and to make an order or to get in contact with you? You know, it's a 21st, it's a 24 seven signpost, right? It's something that's out there all the time. It's easy enough for people to find if it's set up right. Do you make it easy enough for them to, to use it that you can attract international customers? So here's, um, I guess some of this is similar to what we just talked about, but kind of in the same vein is, um, you know, a lot of the principles that are going to be taught about website globalization apply to any website or any kind of marketing um, activity that you would do. So the efforts that you make to make your website easy for international customers to you applies directly to your domestic customers as well. It's kind of a, a nice two for one there. I think primarily, um, if, you're, if you have a confusing website, um, you're gonna miss out. You're gonna miss out. You're gonna miss out on people being able to access it. People, when they get to your website, and you can think of your own experience. When, you, when you're accessing a website, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is, is it running slow? Is it, are the images slow to load? Does it not have a very friendly user interface? All of this makes an impression of the whole business, right? The business might be very competent. They might provide a great product, but if the website isn't easy to navigate, chances are they're losing customers. And so that just having it set up from the beginning so it's easy to use, that's one of the first things. And then having a very clear value proposition up front. What makes you different? What makes it so that a customer can't afford not to do business with you? And, and that you know, applies both to domestic and international. And then having a clear and easy call to action or a clear and easy um, route for them to take the next step, right? I think uh, if I see your product and it sounds fantastic and I really want to buy it or I really want to talk to somebody about it, and then I can't figure out how to do the contact form or there's not a clear email address listed, then once again, you're losing, you're losing the opportunity to engage with potential customers. So when you're setting up your website for the international side of things, um, you're thinking, okay, well, do I want to just have an international page on my website? Do I wanna have a little translation widget? What do I need to do to start in making it easy for international companies? So I'm just gonna walk through a couple of different scenarios here and um, you know, maybe some use case scenarios for those scenarios and why you would want one versus the other, right? So the localized aspect, this is the ideal case scenario for a, an international website, but it's also the most expensive. You would have a completely separate site or country of your choice. Like in this case, I have Japan and you can see that Google has a site for Japan, google.jp. It uses that country code top level domain. In the US, we use .com a lot, 
right? It's, it's just kind of what we have. We don't really have a .us as much. Um, that's not something you see very often. But if you had like a .jp for Japan, that provides a lot of trust among Japan consumers to know that your site is a Japanese site, it's hosted in Japan, and it has a lot of you know, things that they're looking for, Japanese language, uh, you know, the way it's laid out, the format, the measurements. But as I said, that's the most expensive because it's a completely different site. You have to manage it differently. You have to host it differently. Like it's, it's a separate site from what you, current, you currently would have. So if you have enough business in a country to justify that, definitely look at setting that up. And there are great resources within um, here in California that can help you. There's grants that can help you expand your website. You know, you just from a business perspective, if you want to expand your website, you kind of want to make sure that you can justify it based on the sales you're getting from that country. And that applies to, to any of these strategies. But I think a, a lower cost strategy that you can do, like let's say you're getting enough traffic from a country to justify, and the rule of thumb is about 5%. 5% traffic from that country, you can start to look at justifying, expanding your website into a specific country or, or language. Um, but you want to expand, you have this option, you know there's a market for you there. Well, a good option could be creating a subfolder, or you can see that it's google.com slash Japanese or slash Japan, right? So that could be your subfolder within your website structure. And it, it's a clear signal to people in that country that you're willing and ready to do business with them. That, you know, and you have, you either have a customer service support, you're able to ship to that country, you know, all the different things that go with helping a customer in that country. When they see a, a page dedicated specifically to their country or language, they can have that confidence. You're rolling out the welcome map for them and making it easy for them to, to get on your website. And then another way that you could do it is using a subdomain. So japanese.google.com or japan.google.com. What, what I've seen where you would use this setup is when you want to kind of disconnect or decouple that international website from your US website. If it's a subfolder, all of the, you know, in that, in that number two option, if it's subfolder, all of the, the SEO content that you're generating for that site will be linked to your site. Um, but in that, if you're using the subdomain, it kind of separates that a little bit so that, um, you know, oftentimes people will do this for their blog, maybe. You know, it's blog.google.com and whatever blog article they're putting through, it's not going to um, come up in their search engine results as, as much related to the main website. So there's, there's kind of a use case for it, but I think if you're getting started, you know, and you have the, the time and the energy to devote to it, you might just try expanding your US website. But there are a lot of other things that you can do before then, before you get to the point of expanding, that can just help customers feel welcome and appreciated. And so we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so I think the first thing, Kind of going into the search engine side of things. Well, with search engines, what's the goal, right? The goal is to, to rank highly in the search engine. That's how people find you. And the main thing that a search engine uses to find you is the content that you have on your website. So when I say content, I'm, you know, you can talk about media, pictures, all of that, but the search engine can't understand pictures or videos. Um, it has to look at the transcript. It has to look at the the caption and has to look at the language that's surrounding them. So I have on, on this little computer here, you can see the Dominican University website. It looks really nice. It has lots of bright colors. And then the text underneath it, that's what the search engine is seeing. So the search engine goes out, crawls the web, finds everything, grabs that text, brings it back, indexes it. So it stores it in a nice, easy way and then it uses an algorithm to rank it. And, and some of the things that the search engine is going to look at when it's ranking is what does your content match up with? So if I search for Dominican University, that would show up. It's, that's something that's you know, repeatedly written in text on the website. But if I search for a specific degree, 
Um, is that going to show up? Well, that depends on the language that Dominican has around that specific degree. Does it have enough supporting content to show the search engine that the site should be considered among the results, right? So just kind of some of the basic explanation, I'm sure some of this is already, you know, something that you already know about, but just kind of going through it from an international perspective, same thing. You have to have the search words there that people are going to be searching for internationally. Are you, do you have international savvy consumers who are going to be searching in English or are you know, international com companies that search in English or do you need to make accommodations to search it, uh, to have content in other languages for people who are searching in other languages? So kind of as a reminder, you know, when, when people are getting those search results, they usually just look at the top few results. After 10 results or so, you're off the first page. And I know that that's, I mean, that's kind of the terminology, right? You're, you want to be on that first page, you want to be in the first 10 results or first five results, it's even better. Um, so it's, it's all about bringing it all together. Um, when you're looking internationally now, there are a lot of different search engines internationally. Um, Google is the leader. Google is the leader in just about every country. But if you're looking at, um, you know, if you're looking at a, a client in China, Baidu might be, you, you'd want to register your site with Baidu, or you'd want to register your site with Google China, right? You'd want to do something to help get your site into the loop in that international, in the international space. Uh, in South Korea, it might be Naver. Uh, that's one that's pretty popular. Right? But in most countries, Google is the popular one, but it's a different Google site. If you remember I showed you google.jp for Japan. Google.jp has a different index, you know, and it has its own, it's its own site, it's its own domain. So you kind of have to register your site with each country that you want it to be in. Um, and then um, as you're making your site, um, easy for international people to look at and you're trying to modify your content to make sure it's what people are searching for. Here are some of the principles that you can do with that too. So long tail keywords. It, um, basically, human nature is when we search, we're searching for something specific. So you think about the, the last Google search that you typed in. Did you just type in shoes? Or did you type in, you know, I want this type of running shoe specific for this color. And, you know, usually you type in a couple more specific words. And if you're typing in a specific enough search, that usually means that you are ready to move forward with, with that. You're, you're much more likely to convert into a sale or to turn into a potential customer with that really specific search. Um, and those are the keywords that, um, that are easier to, to win when you're doing your advertising, those are the key, or when you're doing your content on your site, it's much easier to win at the, at the specific words, at the specific phrases, and especially if they're longer. So when you're looking at your website, you're looking at the value that you provide, what your customers would be searching for, looking at those long phrases or longer keywords that they're searching for, and then you're, you're making sure that your site has the content on it, the wording, either as a trans, you know, transcript of the video, captions, and then also uh, pages of content that are you know, written up that say, this is the value to you, this is the product that we're talking about. You know, when you have that written out, that's when the search engine can find you and make sure that you're among the top results for your customers. Um, if you haven't done this already, I would highly recommend having an analytics account or an analytics system set up for your website. Um, it's probably the number one thing you could do if you, if you wanna sell online and you wanna understand how people are buying from you or what their behavior is, having the analytics is just essential. I've used Google here as an example. Um, there are other analytics programs out there, but it's, if you think about when you're selling a product and you see, you get to meet people's needs, you know, and, and you see their eyes light up and they say, wow, this is really cool. I'm gonna use this and I'm gonna tell my friends about it, right? 
when they're online, you can't see that in real time, but you can see it through the analytics. So you say, oh, um, who's getting excited about this website? Who's getting excited about our service, our product? Which country are they coming from? You know, how long are they spending on the website? What are they clicking on? You know, what is their next step, right? Understanding that information is just, it's going to provide so much more value to you. And, and then what's, you know, it's gonna provide so much value to you for your customers and understanding your customers and what they want from you. And so I'm just going to go through a couple of changes that you can make to your website right now. And you don't have to build out a whole new site or a whole new page. You can just start making these changes now and it will provide you with uh, great, you know, great international like welcoming gestures. So one, just including your international address, you know, spelled it all out, having the country code in front of your phone number, having a contact page with um, the op opportunity for them to put in their country, say, yep, I'm from this country. Just including the, um, you know, the having an international sales page specifically. So put it international sales, click here, you know, a link for international people using international formats and standards, time measurements, all of that. And then also colors, you know, colors can make a difference. Um, so that, I mean, that's more when you start to localize your site, but just understanding that all of this can make a difference for, for other people and what they're looking at. And then when it comes to translation, um, you always wanna have a professional to be there translating with you. Um, that's, you know, that's one of the things where that really increases the cost of having an international website. Um, but in the meantime, you could consider doing something like just having that uh, translation widget, something that can, they can translate it with, but they don't have to do the whole thing. Or, you know, you don't have to put it all in yourself. It can, it can be a machine translation, right? So that's kind of the in intermediary step. But uh, so those are, this, those are some of the tips and tricks that I've talked about. And, and now I want to turn it over to um, a great company here in California that has started implementing some of these processes and, and um, seen the results. So. Thank you so much, Joshua. I really appreciate it. To share their experience with website globalization, we have Shirley Feather, owner of Feather's Hair Care. Please join me in welcoming Shirley. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right, just making sure. So um, my name is Shirley Matilton Feather and I'm an enrolled member of the Yurok tribe. So Ayakwi, Neknao, Mewe, Machak, Wetchpus, um, Nainos, Walter Feather Jr. Round Valley. So today I greet you in my native language and let you know that I'm from the village of Wichpec and that my husband is from Round Valley. Um, so we own um, Feathers Hair Artistry LLC. We have a beauty supply for sulfate free, paraben free products, and we also have um, a native owned and operated hair care, Feathers Hair Care. And I just wanted to go over very briefly, we're gonna get into the meat of this and go pretty quick because I have seven minutes to get to um, what we've incorporated based off of the analytical report from Elizabeth and Joshua and the US Commercial Service. They um, came in, we had a meeting with them. They had their experts go through our web page, and they gave us a breakdown of how we could incorporate these things to increase our sales. So while we were building another web page, these are just simple things that we did to um, every day for our social media. And we saw a 36% increase in sales consistently for over three months. So we, um, we reviewed the report that they gave us. We chose four simple things to do every single day. We tried to keep it under a 30 minute time frame that we could adapt to our daily regimen of social media. But seven days a week, we did this. So. The first thing we did was a current market analysis of our target market. 
And then we, um, we added hashtags of relevancy to every single post that we did. And I just, I read like the hashtag Bible for like hashtags of relevancy. And like, so we did hashtags on every single post. We tagged periodicals, magazines, um, any type of place that we could get massive exposure for mutual interest. And then once um, we also added links of our webpage to every single post with the hashtags and the tagging of periodicals. But then once we got exposure from the periodicals, we took that post and we um, did a push on it on social media and we did a 250 mile spread for $30. You can do like $5, $7, but I did like seven days, 250 miles. Um, around us to push that periodical or magazine exposure um, to get our name out there a little bit further and get people reading about our um, product line that we have. Um, and based off of that, um, we had a really high engagement. We had 850 non-followers um, go into our site. And then through that, we had an increase in sales. We also did simple direct descriptions of every item, uh, less than one paragraph under each picture with the, the links and also the hashtagging and then tagging for exposure. Um, three to five times a day, we did that. We tracked all of our sales daily and weekly and we compared it to last year's sales. And then wherever we saw the highest amount of growth, so if we had a post that had 64 hits versus a post that had two hits, the posts that had 64 hits would be the posts that we would um, increase our efforts with or use for ads to um, maximize our return. Then we did, um, we tracked um, all of the analytics on our website to see where our potential for growth from. And then we looked into those markets for the boost on social media. So you'll get the analytics on your website and you can see where um, maybe your local area is Sonoma County, but you're getting hits in Solano County. So then you know that in Solano County, if you were to put your ad out in Solano County, you'll have a high engagement. So we tried to follow the analytics on our website for where we did most of our, um, our boosts on social media. We tracked our Google analytics and um, for the sum of effectiveness as well. And then, in, and also with that, we took the analytics from the pro dashboard on social media. So you'll have a professional dashboard on that. And we opened it up. And what we found was that we had a 64.2% um, increase in engagement by doing this, by adding our web page link by adding hashtags, by tagging periodicals, by marketing um, outside of our local area. We live in a town of 16,000 people. It's pretty rural here. And um, I'll be honest, I have like no computer savvy at all. Prior to this, never used a computer for anything. So this was really out of my comfort area, but we instantaneously seen an, seen an increase in our sales. So I mean, we could never go back to running our business the other way. We have to just push forward and keep going now. Um, and we took the uh, we took the analytics from the dashboard, and you can see all of your posts. You can go into your posts, you can go into your reels, you can go into your stories, and you can see the ones that have the highest amount of engagement. So that way, you know which ones to do your pushes with. So. The 850 non-followers doesn't seem like a lot, but these are people who don't follow our page, don't engage with our business, but actually opened our web page and went in and opened up the links. And so this is a graph that I have. I'm not sure if you can see that really clearly, but it's last year's sales versus this, this year. So the red is this year, the tan is last year, but you can see last year I had one, two, three, really high peaks where somebody opened my webpage and they bought something. And this is from February 9th through April 10th. So two month period, basically. Um, the, the red is this year, I had one, two, three, 
four, five. These are people who do five people within a month period who do not follow our page, are not customers, do not engage with us on any level, but went in and had a purchase of a substantial amount, which increased our sales. Then we have this one here, and I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly, but this is this, this is this year and this is last year. So we have January, February, and March, and you can see that consistently each month we've had over a 36% increase in sales just by applying these simple things to our business. And we actually, it's been six months. So we, we started the process in October and right after our meeting with Elizabeth and her team, the next day we started applying it. We didn't see a return right away, but within a two week period we did. And by the time we did have an engagement from um, a magazine company, we got the cover of a magazine. When that happened, we had a reputable social media presence with links and hashtags, and it just made it that much easier for the exposure and to push forward with globalizing. So, I mean, in the process of developing your web page or making those changes to your web page, these are just simple things that you can do to increase your sales, and you definitely see a return on it. And it doesn't matter where you're at. I mean, realistically, we, we've been shipping products all over the United States already based off of these simple little things we do. And we've had people actually coming to our businesses and um, that have never shopped with us before. So it, it really has helped our family and it's helped our business. And we're talking at a point in time where there had been a declared uh, state of emergency. The roads were closed. We were snowed in. There was no phone lines and our sales were up consistently every day. So it, it does work. It's a testimony and um, I think it's powerful. And I think it, it's only gonna help your business to apply these little things and push forward. It's just, just time and energy. So I appreciate everyone having me here today and allowing me to share my journey with you. And I wish everyone the best with their business. And thank you for your time. And I'm gonna turn this over to Elizabeth. Okay, we're gonna go back to Joshua to talk about the st second strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, great examples from Shirley about just the small things that you can do now to that will make a difference on your on your business. Um, I think one of the things that as you're looking at exporting um, is, well, where do I start? How do I get going? Um, I don't have enough staff, you know, I, or maybe I sell uh, products and I just, I haven't ever considered selling them to international people. Do international people even need these things, right? So one of the things that you can do to help um, kind of get things started is kind of outsourcing your exports. Essentially, you could work with an export management company. And so um, we'll talk about what, what they are, why, why you would use one, and when to kind of consider that. So an export management company, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of definitions. It's kind of one of those areas where there's a lot, you know, everything has a flavor, but essentially it's usually a third-party company that's handling some aspect of exporting. Is it, are they acting on commission and they're selling your, your products or are they doing just the marketing? Um, sometimes just export services kind of get lumped in here, but usually the export management company does something with the sales marketing distribution. They might buy it from you at wholesale and then resell it to someone else, kind of acting as a distributor or an intermediary. Um, so you might think, oh, when would I, when would I use an export management company? Um, or why would I use one, right? Well, some of the benefits, um, you, know, you have someone that's exported before, they understand the differences in culture. Usually they have already have contacts in the country. Um, they often sell a product that's similar to yours or like complementary to yours or in a similar industry space as yours. 
And so um, they can take your product, fit it in with their existing products, and then sell it to their already established partnerships. Okay. Uh, generally, it's it's a lower margin, uh, you know, when you're working with an export management company. I mean, not always, but but especially if you're just getting started, and it's like everything helps, right? Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of staff, but even something that you're selling at a lower margin is is helping build your business and is helping kind of establish the credibility of your product and your brand. Um, so, when you would want to use it. Well, if you're facing staffing shortages, if you have smaller um, smaller products or small like lower value products, it's really hard to get to the economies of scale um, when you're shipping internationally. You know, you might have some really dedicated customers that would buy one or two of your product, um, but if you could sell a whole pallet load or a whole truck load, I know that's maybe beyond. That's kind of incredible to think about, but if you could sell several uh, large orders, then it's much easier to ship, right? So that's one of the benefits of having an export management company. They can aggregate shipments, ship it all together, and then the shipping is cheaper for them, and they can still sell your product in kind of the ones and twos that you might, you might only be getting orders of ones and twos right now until you can start getting orders of hundreds and two hundreds. And then if you wanna maximize the number of countries that you're active in, maybe you say, work out an opportunity for someone to, to just handle one or two countries or to expand into a new countries or to start with a new product, right? You can kind of split it um, based on what you feel comfortable with and what you have available to share with other people. So the Rural Export Center, we're putting together, or we've, we've put together a, an export management company directory. Um, and it's national, nationwide, has a broad range of in industries. So we're working on putting it into our website so you can access that list. But until we get that uploaded completely onto our website, we'll do a free consultation where we'll help you identify some export management companies. And then you can choose which one works best for you, which one you feel like complements with your brand and your value. And uh, you, know, you can work with them. So that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth who will introduce you to a company that knows that actually act as, is active in the export management company area. Thanks so much, Joshua. To share their experiences with EMCs, we have Mark Schultz, who's the owner and president of Nature's Sun Grown Foods. Please join me in welcoming Mark Schultz. Morning, everybody. Thank you for having me today. It's great to meet all of you and to get a chance to talk with you about export management companies and exporting. It's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to grow your business in a, in, a, in a world that for many of us is, is completely foreign, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I'm visiting today from San Rafael where our company is headquartered and Nature Sun Grown Foods, we have been exporting food products, primarily food products, to our customers in Asia as well as Europe for over 20 years. So as you can see the map behind me, we're taking products from home and sending them abroad for manufacturers and food processors all over the United States. So if you'd allow me to share my screen, I'll um, take you quickly through a presentation to help explain best how we work as an exporter and export management company. So Nature Sun Grown Foods, um, we call ourselves exporter. We're exporting to primarily Pacific Rim and, and Europe. And I'd like to take just a moment because there's a, it really bears defining. Export management company, if you look at the classic definition is more or less a broker where they're responsible for locating the um, business on your behalf. And um, they are compensated um, typically as a percentage of sales. It could be 5%, it could be 10% of sales. But they don't actually take title to the goods. So it ultimately leaves your, you responsible to um, ensure the, 
that your products arrive in in country as well as as well as collective for and receivable. And I, I want to emphasize that um, exporting or, or selling internationally requires core competency, not only to understand what products will sell in a foreign market, but also uh, the documentation that's required to get the products um, imported into that foreign country. Um, it's all done on documentation. And producing those documents is something that you can do. You, there's a learning curve, or you can rely on a company um, to do that for you. And that's what we do at Nature Sun Grown Foods. But then, and perhaps the single number one most important thing, is collecting that foreign receivable. We've heard nothing but horror stories from many small businesses that we've met over the years who have had wonderful experiences selling their products into foreign countries, but unfortunately, they didn't get uh, much cooperation when it came to getting paid. And you all know how important that is. So the term export management company versus an exporter or a trading company, which is engaged in, in the activity of basically buying and selling the goods. Uh, the exporter procures the products and, and sells into the foreign market and does so um, from the manufacturer's own manufacturing plant, or they can, um, uh, as Joshua mentioned a minute ago, can consolidate orders. So for instance, that you've seen these big sea containers that are shipped on, on the ocean, a uh, sea container can hold 10, 20, as many as 40 pallets. Well, if you only have two pallets to ship, it, it's much more um, economical to combine those pallets with other companies' products, which is something that export companies do. Um, I'll give you just a little flavor, if I may, of our products. It won't take a tremendous amount of time, but uh, our, our categories, just to give you a flavor for, again, what really is the unknown. How do these products get to foreign countries and what are these products? So in our, in our world, meat and poultry, so you'll see brands listed here, the companies that we work with on a regular basis, that we're buying these products that are made here in the U.S. and some of these brands you'll recognize. Uh, in meat and poultry and dairy, uh, we're an organic certified trader. We are the nation's first and only organic certified exporter. So we buy products made by organic manufacturers and food processors, and we export those products to countries all over the world. And effective March of 2023, it will be a requirement for all exporters that are exporting organic products to be organic certified. That might not sound like a much, but right at the present time, no organic certification is required to export. But the manufacturers are organic certified, and of course the importers are organic certified. It's closing the gap. It's something that the USDA announced a month ago. Goes into effect in 11 months. Other brands that we export today in uh, natural grocery food service and ingredients as well. So just real quickly, an exporter is a trading company. They buy and sell the goods, take title, pay the manufacturer typically in 30 days. So you get paid in 30 days, you're done. And then our job is managing all the details to complete that foreign transaction including arranging the logistics for air and or sea shipments, creating documents that are required for the importer, and as we talked about a minute ago, getting paid. Um, and also, not to be, not to, certainly not to minimize, a very, very important aspect is growing your volume in that foreign country. Once the product gets there, what happens? Well, a, a company such as Nature's Sun Grown Foods will attend trade shows on your behalf. To, de to help develop demand, as well as work with customers in country to grow product sales. So uh, our big pitch is partnering with um, export or export management companies will enable you to grow your volumes domestically as a domestic sale, incremental volume growth, without having to create a whole lot of new core competencies within your organization. Now, real briefly, in the time that I have, I'll share with you uh, an example of a company that has benefited from working with uh, an export trading company, and that's a barbecue sauce. We are all familiar with barbecue sauce, and this gentleman that makes Triple Crown barbecue sauce has a wonderful product, sells it to many grocery stores nationally in the U.S., and they wanted to grow into Japan and Korea. So we helped them do that. We now export a beautiful organic um, barbecue sauce, 
And it all started because the owner went to Japan and went to Korea and, and he got some interest, but he didn't know how to handle it. Didn't know quite how to collect the receivable, do the documents, all of that. So that's where we created a partnership. We do products for, um, products that are grown in California, such as raisins or rice, not just in retail sizes. In fact, most of our volume goes into food service or ingredients used by manufacturers and food processors. So there's a whole multitude of, of areas that um, we can touch. It's just easier to display in consumer products because we all recognize them in the grocery store. So I appreciate your time today and for allowing me to share with you a little bit and, and welcoming you into our little home in, uh, in the ocean of San Rafael. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, before I turn it over, I realize uh, that we did not, we do not have a section to tell you what the next step is. And I don't wanna take much time, but, um, and Jessica, I tried to put it in the chat, but wasn't able to put it in where everybody can see it. So how do you connect with all these resources? We have offices and embassies and consulates around the world that help us on this end, help you export. But we also have a network of, of folks around the country. So you do have a local office. And what I would invite you to do is reach out to me at elizabeth.krauth, Elizabeth Krauth. And if someone could put it in the chat where everyone can see, that would be great. Um, elizabeth.krauth at trade.gov. And I will immediately connect you with your local office, who will then be able to provide these services connect you with uh, Joshua and the, and the REC, the Rural Export Center for their services, et cetera. But it starts with connecting with your local office. So please feel free to reach out to me and I will do that. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Cynthia Murray to moderate the Q&A and uh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to our speakers, uh, Mark and Shirley and Joshua, really uh, terrific information. We only have a few minutes. I have two questions in the chat that I'll start with. One is, uh, uh, Joshua, they wanted clarification on which search engine you said was popular in the UK. Uh, they don't, uh, they couldn't read what you had on the screen. Could you tell us? Yeah, Google is the most popular. It has over 90% of the market there. And uh, I just put a link also in the Q&A. So if you wanted to look up more information, you can go to Stats Counter. Uh, it's a website that provides some um, some free stats about search engine usage and search engine uh, market sizes in countries across the world. And then um, to Shirley, a couple questions for you. One is, could you uh, say which social media sites you found most beneficial, Shirley? Hi, thank you. Yeah. Um, I would have to say um, Instagram. Instagram seemed to be the, the largest pool. It has the best analytics on it for you to follow. And you just go to your pro dashboard and we were able to see which uh, posts had the highest level of engagement. Um, as far as getting uh, periodicals published to push your product further and get more exposure, we found that was Facebook. And it was just, and I mean, thousands of submissions, thousands, and to get one response. So you just take that response and you, and you go with it. And that's what you push into other markets. And then you use the analytics from your Google, your web page, and from your social media of where it'll give you a map and it has a little circle for the map. And you can extend that or retract it, but you can put it in the market that you want to push that boost. And you just, you can do $5. It's so easy, okay? Do you, uh, before you go, they also uh, wanted you to clarify on that bullet list where you had one, two, three, which ones, um, what you implemented to spike your sales. They, they oh. couldn't read it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, we, we had an analytical report done by Elizabeth and her team, Joshua helped us. And I mean, it was, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, if you're not computer savvy, have them help you. They did like this diagram. It was kind of embarrassing third grade level, but realistically that's where most of us process at. 
And because I'm not computer savvy, I didn't even know what a crawler is. So they explained it to me, basically like the video today. And um, then they pulled apart the web page that we had, which was not functional. And they told us all this information. They give you a report. It's you know a few pages long, but it's all kinds of tidbits in there of how to grow your business. And so even if you're globalizing in the process of globalizing your business, these are things you can apply. I went through and I just looked for things that would take less than 30 minutes for me to incorporate four of them and do them every day. And the first one was applying hashtags. The second was applying my webpage links to it. And then the third was reviewing the analytics daily and comparing it to last year's sales. So is that helpful? I think that's great. Thank you so Thank much. You so, Sharon. Much. so Mark, a couple questions for you. One is, do you know if a certificate of origin is required to ship to Canada for a U.S. made product? The uh, short answer is yes. The long answer is yes. Okay. But it can be country specific. Not all countries require us to include a certificate of, of origin, COA, um, with all the other documents. Thank you. And then I believe this next question is for you too, Mark. It, the questioner says, I have a rural micro business using very specific wild crafted and locally grown and processed indigenous plants like blue corn flour. What does exporting look like for my business? Oh, I'm sure, sure the, the prospects look excellent. Um, we just, we, we need to know more about the products and the ingredients. And then the first thing we do is, is check with what, um, if any restrictions um, are, are, are in place in target countries. And Joshua, would you have a response to that too? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, from, from our point, it's, you know, Elizabeth Krauth, who's a great representative of the commercial service there locally. She can help you work with overseas offices who can advise you on some of the specifics about exporting. Um, we also do a research style projects. So if you wanted to see specifically, for, for example, blue corn flour, which market is using more blue, cor blue corn flour and why and how much are they using? That's some of the information that we can provide, which then helps you when you work with people like Mark to make you know, those decisions and to work with Mark and decide, hey, like what's the best strategy? This is our information and this looks like the best market for us to pursue. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, they're asking for your contact information in the chat. I haven't had a chance to look, but if you haven't put it in, please do. And then I had a question for you, Mark. Do you export to all countries or different export brokers have more specificity in the regions they serve? T typically, it's the latter. You know, the world's a big place. And so as Nature Sun Grown Foods goes, uh, our proximity to Asia, that is our biggest market. But that being said, we export rice that's grown in California to Europe. Uh, we are selling Parmesan cheese to Saudi Arabia. Domino's, we all know Domino's. Well, Domino's likes Parmesan cheese from the USA. We figured it out. In other words, we, we, we know how to, how to, where to go to the right places to find the answers we need to, to succeed in other parts of the world. But currently, no, we, we're certainly not in all countries. So if I'm looking to begin exporting, who is the best person to go to to get advice about which countries I should start with? Would that be you, Mark, or Joshua, or Shirley? How did you figure it out? Good question. We're, we're entirely happy to help any way we can. Joshua, what do you think? Uh, exporting is kind of one of those things where you have, um, it takes a village, right, to use that phrase. Uh, I think, you know, like there in California, you have Elizabeth Krauth, who's the commercial service contact, who's going to refer you. She's kind of the information broker from the commercial service, right? She'll refer you to the, to the person who can help. Um, if she feels like, hey, you could use the Rural Export Center, she'll refer you to us, right? Um, but then you also have a lot of great, like this meeting right here with Dominican and, and the SBDC that they mentioned as a partner who can help you, maybe you're not quite ready for exporting, you just need to do some business work first here in, locally. And then companies like Mark and, and uh, you know, I think you kind of have to, we try to work together the best way possible and you kind of have to weave your own web of this is what's gonna be exporting for me and my company. 
Shirley, how did you figure out where you wanted to export to? Um, I actually reviewed the analytics from our web page and from our Google and where we had the highest peaks. I mean, that's, I, we just follow the numbers. I mean, the numbers don't lie. And it seems to have worked for us. After we did the boost, um, the local area next to us is Sonoma County and um, the average household income is double where I'm at. So that's where we did our marketing. And it seemed to be highly effective for us. People were willing to drive to where we're at or order from us in that area. So it just we just followed the numbers basically in the analytics. Well, I really want to thank again our speakers. Uh, we are out of time, and I really appreciate um, Joshua Erickson, Shirley Feather, and Mark Schultz uh, for the terrific presentations and sharing their experience and expertise with us. And thank you, Elizabeth Kraut from the Export Center, and Dr. Denise Lucy, my partner in the Business Edge briefings. Uh, I want to remind everyone that our next Business Edge briefing will be on May 17th, and this will be creative ways to fund your business. So uh, any business uh, that's looking to get increased funding, please attend, and you can purchase your tickets on Eventbrite. And then we also have, uh, through the Institute of Leadership Studies, a leadership lecture series that uh, Dominican puts on in partnership with Book Passage. And there's one in just a couple of days on April 24th, there's an in-person presentation with Leela Motley. And then on May 7th, again in person, one o'clock with uh, the actor, actor Laura Dern, uh, which should be fascinating. And then June 14th, also in person at 7 p.m., the, the one and only Isabella Lende. So um, terrific lineup there of uh, lecture series pres presentations. And all of those, you can purchase tickets at dominican.extendedsession.com. Uh, and we hope you will join us there. We are very, very happy that you joined us today. We um, will be able to share the recording and the slides, um, and that will be something sent to you as an attendee afterwards. And we really thank you for coming and hope to see you at our next Business Edge briefing. Thank you very much.